Good morning. Welcome to the Sasagawa Peace Foundation USA policy briefing series. It is great to see so many familiar faces in the audience, as well as welcome new friends. I am Satohiro Akimoto, President and Chairman of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA, or Sasakawa USA. Thank you very much for joining. I am delighted to have you all. Sasakawa USA is a nonpartisan 501c3 organization dedicated to deepening the understanding of and strengthening the relationship between Japan and the United States in the Asia Pacific context for the good of free and open international community. Before we begin the event, let me quickly go over meeting protocol. Today's event is on the record and is being recorded. Video and recap of the, uh, will be posted on Sasagawa USA website. How to change screen view? Manually change between speaker and gallery views. How to ask a question during Q&As? Use the raise hand found on the participant list and please unmute your microphone when called upon. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our esteemed speaker and my friend, Professor Nobukatsu Kanehara. Professor Kanehara was one of the leading strategic thinkers in the second Abe administration. Anybody who is familiar with the Professor Kanehara knows he has an independent and thoughtful mind supported by his mastery of history and facts. While it is too early to definitively gauge historical significance of the second Abe administration, it is certainly the longest serving administration and one of the most strategically oriented administration in terms of Japan's engagement in the international community in the post-war period. Professor Kanehara, in his capacity as Assistant Chief Cabinet Secretary from 2012 to 2019, and Deputy Secretary General at the National Security Secretariat from 2013 to 2019, play a major role in the closest policy circle around Prime Minister Abe. Prior to joining the second Abe administration, Mr. Kanehara enjoyed a long and distinguished career at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, covering a wide range of important subject matters and the region. He was awarded Order of Legion d'Honneur from France. Mr. Kanehara is currently a professor at the Doshisha University in beautiful Kyoto. Professor Kanehara will talk about 30 minutes on the main theme of his new book, Lekishi no Kyokun. The book casts a light on Japan's early modernization and hope as a late developer in comparison to the Western powers and analyze why it went so long, so wrong, ended up in the terrible destruction of the nation and the region. There are lots to learn for the Japanese to help navigate the future course of Japan, but I think the main message of the book is relevant to all of us. So Professor Kanehara, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Akimoto-san. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for having me. The, I, I wrote a book, this one, and uh, the title is Lessons of History, but subtitle is The Reasons of Japan's Failure and future national strategy. That's, that's the uh, subtitle of my book. Let me explain the background and the contents of that, the, the points of the books. Uh, the book, uh, in 2015, it was the 70th anniversary of the end of the Pacific War, and Prime Minister was willing to release a statement on history. And the Prime Minister and myself had long discussions, very long discussions, maybe every two weeks, uh, each time one hour and more, and the how to frame the new statements. And he released the statements. It was a, it was a tremendous success. And that was highly appreciated inside, outside Japan. And his popularity went up in this way. And the, this book is my version of the achievements or the results of discussions with the leader. The first point to make is we have to make clear where we stand. 
the vintage point to look back into the history. And when you look back into the history, you have to bear in your mind what's your future, where you're headed for it. That gives you the grit to understand the frame, to interpret the history, and we need a narrative to unite the nation again. Our Japan has still difficulties to come to terms with the, with the past because generationally and ideologically it is still divided. But we have kids in Japan. My students in Doshi University were all born in 2000. They're very new Japanese. They don't know where the Soviet Union was. They don't understand what the Cold War is. They don't know who is Saddam Hussein. And they, they, they are totally new Japanese. They are now creating a new identity. They are reuniting the nation again. I wanted to pass over our narrative to them. The vintage points, the where we stand to look back to the history, is the very clear that we are now living in the liberal international order. This is the achievements of Japan and the world. The tremendous bloodsheds, revolutions, wars, many big mistakes in the last century, but we created this world where people are happy. And we believe that we are happy in here and we can make others happy. And this new world order, the liberal one, must be protected. I have to say that in the homeland of liberal order, in Europe, in the States, the discussion is we are at disruption of liberal order. In Asia, we are at creation. We had no liberal order in, 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 in Asia. Free camp in Asia during the Cold War was a fake. We had all dictators. But they, after developments of the economy in 1980s, late 1990s, they turned into democracy one by one. Korea, Philippines, Taiwan, etc. Some are still in, under dictatorship, but they are still headed for a, the market economy. And one day, we hope they join our camp. And this is very new. Before that, it was colonial rule. But now we are sure that regardless of skin color, race, ethnic groups, or religion, doesn't matter. The human dignity is absolutely equal. So we have to speak to each other. We have to make consensus to make a rule. Rule is based upon consent or consensus. And that can change. So we have to talk to each other continuously. And people want to contribute to the others. That is the instinct of the people to make society. And there to realize one's purpose of life in the true meaning of freedom. And to guarantee this, we need institutions. This is somehow Greco-Roman institutions, but successful in Japan, in Korea in the Philippines, it's taking roots in Asia. Without these institutional guarantees, we cannot say rule of law, we cannot say the human dignity, we cannot say human rights. And this is a new achievement in Asian history, the introduction of Western democratic institutions. And the world changed gradually. In the, in the 19th century, the advent of the Industrial Revolution in the Great Britain gave huge power to the Europeans. Europeans started to connect the Western world and Asia 15th century by sailing. And sailing technique was very good in Europe. They came to the shore of the Asians, but Asian continents were largely occupied by big empires, Ottomans and Manchus, China, Mughals, Japan, these were, I have to say, all Mongolian, Turkish empires. They are great fighters and good horse riders, except Japanese. And they are, they were kings. But in 19th century, after the Industrial Revolution, Asian powers fell one by one, and nobody survived except Ottoman Empire and Japan. But this system suddenly changed amazingly. 1950s, many Asian African nations got independent. 1960s regime of uh, the state-sponsored racism just fell thanks to Reverend King Nelson Mandela. Before that, Gandhi led India into independence. In 1950s, 60s, world became suddenly flat. The heaven of 
colonial rulers and earth of the Asian Africans just destroyed, evaporated, and flat system came out simply because the maturization of ethics and political awakening of Asian Africans simply happened. And this was the great achievement. And if we look back at the history, we see the seas of these new ideas in French Revolution and in American independence. I have to quote here the Minister Mutsu, Mutsu Munemitsu. He is a very famous Japanese diplomat in the 19th century. He led Japan to the victory of the first Sino-Japanese war. He was a young revolutionary. Uh, he was in jail when he was very young. And he was given a book, um, I think it's in English or something, the World History Book. And it's, a, it's a rather Western World History Book. After reading it, he wrote a poem, says, this is awful, this is jungle, this simply stronger, it's of the weak. But suddenly my eyes were filled with eyes of joy after reading the chapter of American independence. The new ideas of the French Revolution and American independence gave a big shock to the young Japanese revolutionaries in the late 18th, 19th century, simply because it was very, it was very close to, say, the old Asian thinking like Mencius. Mencius said the bad king can be decapitated. The Yoshida Shoin, he is the teacher who led the young revolutionaries in major, major restoration. He, he wrote, just before he dies, 18, 19, 1859, he didn't read English or French or Dutch, but he wrote, explaining Mencius, heaven has no eyes, no ears. So heaven listens to and sees people because uh, the, through people's eyes, people's ears. So heaven's mind is people's mind. And you can know who supports whom. That's, the, that's where the heaven's grace fall. That's the, that's the, the Yoshida Shoin's work, the um, thinking, the enlightenment, enlightenment, enlightenment thinking is very close to Asian, Asian Confucius thinking, and Japanese had not very big difficulties to understand the new thinking of Westerners, and they were shocked to see that, and they absorbed it. But then why Japan, why could Japan not wait for it? the maturization of the world's order? If we could have waited until 1950s, 60s, 70s, it was not, absolutely not necessary to fight the big wars against the Westerners. The reason is very simple. We had a great liberal thinkers. We had many strategic ones. Even Yamamoto Admiral who attacked Pearl Harbor knew very well we could never win against the Americans. Then why Japanese did not wait the time coming towards the liberalization of the world order. It's very simple. Our system was very bad. Our constitutional system was very bad. In our system, the command line of the military went, came from the emperor and then, and he has no staff. In the palace, there's no bureaucracy there. He was just, he was just in the shrine he was worshipped, his authority was very high, but he had no staff. He has no chief staff, he has no bureaucrats, nobody is supporting him. And below, the government was excluded. The prime minister and others, the foreign minister, other ministers had no right to touch the command lines. We had joint staff called Dai Hong Ye. The joint staff, it is virtual. And in theory, it was, simp it, was, it was established only when war started. We had one in Sino-Japanese war, we had one Russo-Japanese war, and it was closed. When Sino-Japanese war started, 1937, it was recreated, but it's virtual. In the early time of Meiji time, we had a strong leaders, and army and navy were small, they were cooperating with each other. In 1930s, Army Navy were very independent, very big, very modern. They hated each other, 
beat Navy, not beat Army, but was there. It was their cliche. And they didn't, they did not coordinate at all. And the government was excluded from the thinking. And the army started to invade Manchuria. And then it started the big war in the continent. It was not necessary to go to Manchuria. We had never been a continental power, Japan. We are like British. We are always independent from the continent. We came into the continent only two or three times. First one was in the seventh, seventh century. Pek Che, the Korean kingdom was destroyed out of our ally. So we tried to help them, but destroyed by, by, by China, we withdrew. Second time was 16th century. Then Hideyoshi, the great general, wanted to invade China. So he went in Korea, except these two cases, Japan had absolutely no interest in continental affairs. Many times Koreans came to the shore of Japan to help them simply because they, they feared Mongols, Manchus and Chinese. But we say always said, no, 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 we don't, don't, we don't involve, don't entangle us into continental affairs. It was Japanese, but the army just without consulting emperor, without consulting prime minister, without consulting even headquarters in Tokyo, they started a war in China. And a big mistake. A big mistake was, it was betrayal to the emperor. Nobody punished them. They became heroes in Japan. That was a big, big mistake. And then the war was concluded after Manchuria got independence, but in 1937, the war started again between China and Japan. Chiang Kai-shek fought very well. His strategic communications very well. And the Japan was driven into a big, big sort of Vietnam war. Japanese army was so modern, they could not be defeated, but they could not conquer China. They were too small to conquer whole China. So they were in the Kagamaya and they stayed there. And then the, the big mistake was after Hitler dealing with Stalin curved out Eastern Europe and cut Poland into half. It was not okay. It was not, a, it was not our affairs at all. But the British French started the war against Hitler and French lost the war very quickly. And Churchill was forced to fight alone. And at that time, what Japan thought was the, maybe we could cut the assistance logistic line of for Chiang Kai-shek through Vietnam. They went into Vietnam. The Westerners are very angry. And suddenly Japan said that we should go to Vietnam because French was defeated. We went in. Westerners were very angry. And gradually, people started to say, we have to somehow control Americans. And then the Matsuoka, the foreign minister, the stupid one, he turned the trilateral, tri trilateral alliance, Germany, Italy, Japan, against Russia. He said that now we should look to the Americans and bringing in Russians. Matsuoka is the only foreign minister, Hitler, Stalin was the supreme commander of their army. They just used Matsuoka to buy time. That was a big mistake because suddenly Japan sets United States the first enemy. And then there was, there was no control. They just rolled down to the Pacific War. Emperor ordered Tojo stop the war. And Tojo could not stop it. He became prime minister as well as army minister as well as chief commander army, he could not stop it. And the thing is very simple. Our constitutional system was broken. It was too weak to control the army and navy. And I have to say that who, who fans this tendency for the independence of the army and navy, that's imperial, imperial parliament. They started this argument simply because when the London Disarmament Conference happens, they attack the Prime Minister. Why are you intruding into military affairs? It's Emperor's affairs, not the government. That's, that was the argument of the Parliament. Amazing, isn't it? But this stupid argument prevailed. And then the government was more and more marginalized, and the army and navy became more, very much independent. They ruined the nation. This is what happened. So I have my conclusion is simple. And one is we have to strengthen the civilian control again, 
unfortunately, after the war, the debates on national security in Japan is very ideological. There's no substance at all. You, ha you have to choose, you have to choose the size, east or west. Then the conclusions are very simple. If you're in the Western camp, the conclusion is alliance management, two is the reinforcement of the self-defense force. If you are on the other side, the conclusion is neutrality, no, no armaments. That was very ideological debate. There was no substance. How to defend a nation, how to protect our people. There was no substance in our discussions of national security. This was the situation in nine, up to 1990. After, after, after the Cold War is over, we started to be realistic. And then we came here. The NSC's, uh, Japan's NSC's purpose, a beauty is for the first time, prime minister is given the apparatus to control one the command line, prime minister, defense minister, chief staff, and joint chief staff and three forces on one hand. And he presides over the cabinets, whole governments, including diplomacy, finance, economy, energy, industry, environment, everything. Now he himself is the incarnation of Japan uh, civilian control. Um, and he has an apparatus here to control it. The NSC must work to support prime minister to be effective in his, in his uh, civilian control of the military forces if any contingency happens. This is not tested by fire. I'm a bit worried, but I will hope that this, this could continue. Lastly, I have to, uh, may, may, may I touch upon our new strategy? The, our Japan's national security strategy is based upon three levels. One is the strategic balance. Of course, the target is China. China became too big too quickly, and many don't understand how big China is still in Japan, maybe not, not in the United States, because you are too big. Now, 10 years ago, they were our size, and now they are three times bigger than Japan. They are 70% of American size today. And their military budget is now four times bigger than ours. It's still one quarter of yours. But it's going up very quickly. And China, under sea governments, she, she does not understand our free world at all. And he is expanding by force in Himalayan mountains by force, in South China Sea, East China Sea Day. She does not use naval forces. And I'm sure that you're hearing from China that China would never confront the United States militarily, but China is bullying your allies, friends in the region, using the police forces and the militia. This is what's going on. Uh, the, the skirmishes are our job to, to, to deal with, but the keeping a balance with China strategically, it's only Japan and the United States. Our system here, U.S. Pacific Alliance system, is called hub and spokes. It's very weak in comparison with NATO. And this is not an organization. We don't have a headquarter. This is all bilateral. It's a bunch of bilateral alliances. But I have to say, South Korea is now strategically very confused. The, the government, next one could be different, but this government. And Filipinos, ties, they are not credible military power to rebalance China. We rely upon very much Australians, but they are far away in the South Pacific, and they're small. India is still taxiing, not yet, frying, not yet, but we invest into India a lot. But the, for the moment, the spine of the order, of liberal order in the Pacific is simply Japan-US alliance. And we're serious about it. And the US commitments, US leadership, to rally your friends and allies in the region is vital. And our are not prepared for the South. Our alliance system was heavily oriented for the Russians. Never thought of defending Taiwan, never thought of defending the Philippines, never thought of defending smaller islands from Chinese picking in the South China Sea. And how to stop this, how to engage China is a very important issue. But I have to say, still, the West, Europe, Japan, and the United States, we count 50% of world GNP. China is 16%. China can, could reach your size, could never reach Japan plus US, could never, never reach 
Europe plus Japan plus the United States, but we need leadership. Europeans are far away from China. They don't share threats, perceptions like us, like ours. But when the West is united, we can still engage China. It takes a long time, much of energy, but if the Americans are committed and we can, if we can show our leadership in the region together, we, I believe that we could still keep balance with China and somehow frame them. And in the end, winning side is ours simply, simply because we can never be communist. But they could be democratic one day, but it, it takes a long, long time. Second is Japan should have a, a, a commercial or economic strategy. We are, we are headed for the continent in 1930. It's a big, big mistake. But since then, we never thought of a true maritime strategy as an investing nation. After Sino-Japanese war was over, for prime, first Prime Minister Ito, he said simply, Japan won Taiwan, not Korean Peninsula. And he grabbed Taiwan. Taiwan was a sort of abandoned island because for the Manchus, the forced riders, it was not a very important island for them. That's the reason, that's the reason why they gave that island to us, we modernized the island. Ito thought we should go down to the south, like British, French, or Dutch. We should expand through commerce into the south. We are doing that before Tokyo Shogunate's shutting the water policy to the, to the, to the, to the foreigners. Uh, we need to be connected with the world economy. That was how British, Dutch, French realized their prosperity. We can do the same thing. We should have a big, a big navy. That was, uh, there was a thinker like that before the war. Uh, Sato Tetsutaro, the admiral, he was pushing this idea, he's, he's the only one but he was swept away by the army. We went to the continent. We should go back to this, this idea. Big achievement of other government was simply CPTPP, that's TPP without Americans. Throne is open, waiting for you, but the, this is very important to otherwise the Beijing consensus can be a rule in Asia for free trade. This is not true free trade. If we, if we are successful in, in TPP, we can lead the RCEP, the second big agreement without Americans. This is led by China and India, and India is falling out. <laughs> but, and we have to set in a true high standard, the free trade system here. Japan is serious about that. Japan never led the mega free trade agreements before. And this is Abe-san's first initiative. He's the first one to realize that. And I have to say, Japan is investing a lot now. In 1985, the Japan, like China, 60% of American deficit was with Japan trade deficit. And we are producing all these semiconductors for US, including Pentagon semiconductors. We're very angry. Uh, but we agreed to appreciate them by three times. One dollar, 360 yen before. One dollar became 80 yen at that time. What happened is very simple. We could no longer export because in dollar, the price of Japanese things became three times higher than before. But for the Japanese consumers, everything on earth was 70% off. What happened is very simple. Japan became an investing country. Our companies are, did not die. They are all around the world. In the States, in every state of the United States, we have Japanese companies. Japan is producing roughly 900 million, 900,000 jobs every year in the United States. We are now second biggest investor in the United States in a, in a carbonated amount, only after UK. Amazing, isn't it? Now, the UK, the US and Japan economic relationship is just like UK and the US. It's totally identical. Markets, stock markets price goes on down identically. This became one economy. We're very happy. And it's not only US, we have to connect all over the world with us. And that's our national interest. So keeping free trade system for our investment is very important for us. This is what we're pushing for. Finally, I have to say that, as I said in the beginning, liberal order is not emerging in Asia. During the Cold War, free camp was a fake. Now it's real, liberal order is, is, is now standing up. We're at creation, not at disruption here in Asia and somebody must lead. We're gonna do that, but unfortunately we are peaking out. Our national average age is now amazingly 49 years old. 
50, 60,000 Japanese are beyond 100 years old. And the Americans' average is now 39, like China, like Russia. India, 29. Africans, 1 billion, 19. And it's, it, we can't do it this alone, of course not. But with the American commitment, with the help of Europeans, we have to rally, we can rally some Asian friends in ASEAN. We could engage India, that's born democracy. And we have to incorporate the Latin Americans on the Pacific side. We should take care of Africans that must come up in the latter half of this century. Okay, that's my speech. Thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for your uh, um, thought-provoking uh, speech as you. And I'd like to uh, open the floor for Q&A. As I said, please uh, uh, raise, uh, raise uh, the uh, under We have uh, 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 both of uh, look for uh, uh, vigorous discussion. If I may, uh, I would uh, start the Q&A by uh, uh, exercising the prerogative of a uh, moderator. Uh, this is a contemporary uh, uh, a question. Uh, um, you pointed out the importance of a uh, national security secretariat as a symbol of uh, Japan's uh, uh, civilian control under uh, Prime, Minister, Prime Minister, based on your historical analysis. Uh, definition of uh, uh, or sphere of uh, uh, responsibility of national security has been quickly changing. Uh, pandemic is uh, uh, obviously one thing and uh, uh, economy, uh, uh, technology, uh, 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 another. Uh, recently, uh, uh, Japan's uh, National Security Secretariat established the economic division. Could you talk about the significance of that division and uh, our purpose of it? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you, Akimoto-san. There are two purposes for this new econ section in NSC. One is, I have to say, there, there are two technologies in Japan. One is civil, civil technology. It is far, very, very much advanced ones. Sony or Panasonic, these things. And this, the other is the heavy industries, military technology. There are two aspects of our policy. One is how to control the free flow to China this technology, about these technologies. Problem was, the, we had we have everything. We have everything, but the people in this civilian sector does not know how this can be used for the military purpose, how it is sensitive to the Americans. They don't understand that. Problem is, our defense agency's budget is too small for R&D. It's just, uh, what, it's just uh, 130 billion yen. And it's, it's tiny, it's, 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 it's sesame. So they invest a lot to their own assets. They don't look into the future, civilian technology. So nobody could evaluate which technology is sensitive to our national security. And I'm sure that the Americans, DAPA, or China, knows very well. They, they, I think they, they did the mapping of our technology. So I said, no, we have to gather all the engineers inside the government. Let them, let, make them talk to each other and make them sensitive to the technology flow. And this is, what, this is the first purpose. And now they are working hard on this. And METI is leading this somehow. This is export control. So METI is a leading agency here. And this is one thing that we are doing. So making our engineers sensitive to national security and involving, of course, defense agencies and inter people and somehow control our free flow to of technology to China. And this is, of course, say, uh, this is networking, deep sea cable, 5G, the semiconductors, and other very sensitive technologies, like, like say, data processing, or quantum technology, and the 3D printer. There are 14 uh, points uh, raised by the uh, Commerce Department in Washington. We, we, are now, we are now following that, these areas. With, with 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 care. And the other side is the other side is our military technology. This is this is awful. This is awful because um, the 1970s Prime Minister Miki stopped exports of arms to everybody, including the United States. Amazing, isn't it? UK and the friends and NATO friends. Prime Minister Miki simply ordered, do not stop, do not export anything. So we lost a scale. 
the our military industry i mean the asian biggest military industry is now korea they're exporting a lot it's making good terms we lost it totally and they are making small small number of very expensive assets to sdf what's happening today is that they are leaving the military military sector one by one komatsu is a very famous one they just stopped producing arms vehicles for sdf simply because it doesn't pay and I'm, I'm, we are saying that we have to engage more engineers and scientists to enhance our military technology. For that purpose, we have one engage the academia. They're very much leftists still. They are living in 1950s, very much pacifists. They refuse to cooperate with the government. It's very difficult to engage them. We are now galvanizing the, all the scientists in the civilian sector they are very much still pacifist but we're we're we telling them that defending a nation is the right thing protecting soldiers life is a precious thing we need your cooperation and one by one we're now trying to, to 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 persuade them it's a long way to go but we're doing that and finally we have to start exporting otherwise we cannot take back the merit scale scale, scale, uh, scale merits otherwise our heavy industries can no longer survive. I, I, I mean, the military sectors of our heavy industries can no longer survive. These are thank the topics. Very, thank you very much. We have uh, uh, three uh, uh, heavy hitters on deck. And so I'm gonna go to uh, uh, Mr. Michael Green and then uh, Ambassador David Shear and then uh, Ambassador Russ Deming. So uh, uh, Mr. Green, please. Uh, thanks. Um, congratulations, Nobu. I, I ordered the book Oh, thank you. But it, it's supposed to arrive tomorrow, so I have not done my homework. But I promise I'll read it. Um, and um, it sounds like this is part of uh, the work you did uh, on global history and uh, uh, in preparation for the uh, 70th anniversary. And there is a, um, a whole new context you get um, from taking that perspective. Um, I wanted to ask you, I know that um, the, the, the Prime Minister Abe is very... Um, uh, deeply involved in this research himself and has, has a historical mindset. Uh, most strategic thinkers, you know, use history. Um, but people in Washington are starting to wonder about the post-Abe era. And one of the questions often asked is, will this strategy continue uh, with a different leader uh, in the coming years? And my sense is there's a broad consensus around the strategy described, but maybe not the same deep sense of, uh, of historical context or um, specific uh, policy um, aspects that, that you described. Can you give us a little bit of a flavor? Uh, you don't have to handicap the post-Abe leaders, but what is your sense of the politics behind the strategy you described? Uh, are you worried about it, or do you think that there's uh, deep support across different parts of the LDP and the coalition? Yeah, thank you. Thank, you. thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, we don't know, not yet. It's, it's too early to say <laughs> who would be the prime minister at this moment. It, I'll be punished for doing that, so I don't do that. But um, the, basically, the you know, strategic framework is uncontrollable for Japan. China rises, we need Americans. Not everybody understands that. More and more, the discussion on national security in Japan is less ideological. Uh, people are simply get, getting realistic, uh, in particular young ones. So we can no longer say the, the you know, the unknown, disarmed neutrality, the stupid things, we, we no longer say that. And this basic trend will continue, but I have to say, Abe-san, Aso-san is special. Abe-san is the grandson of Kishi, founder of Japan-US Alliance. And the Aso-san is grandson of Yoshida, the original founder of this Japan-US allies, they are sworn allies to sustain this, the, this, this achievement of their grandpa. And they are personally committed in this. And uh, the, the, so the passion is here for them to push forward the alliance management. And they are keen realist, realists. It was very easy for us to talk to them. Uh, but the strategic reality doesn't change. So we have to we have to persuade and we have to explain a lot to new leaders who should, who, I don't know who should come. I have to say, apart from Ishiba-san, who, 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 whosoever 
become prime ministers, it's a continuation of this government. Ishiba-san says anything but Abe. That's the reason why he's very popular today, but policy-wise, he's 100% identical. <laughs> the national security policy-wise, he's 100% identical. There's absolutely no difference between Abe and Ishiba. So I don't think there'll be no big difference or big change of courses, but rhythm, passion, priority, that we have to ask to the next prime minister. And the next one must be coping with this COVID situation and huge fiscal debts and economic situation. And that could take his much, much of his energy, I mean the new leader's energy in the first, first several months. But there too, we can cooperate. I have to say, Japan, US is okay because Prime Minister is very close to President Trump. We are privileged. But apart from Japan, uh, we, we see the, our unity is very much damaged. Uh, we, we, can, we can get together again with, the, with Washington. And, and nobody is big enough to lead Asia or Europe or the West. And the vacancy of leadership is, is truly hurting our unity. And COVID is one thing too. We can get some money and help others to get the vaccine. Not only rich ones, but the developing ones too. And there, there are so many things to do together. So uh, we need, we need, we need, we need unity, and we need your commitments. We need your leadership for that. So the, my answer is, we are also worried about your leadership <laughs> elections. <laughs> I don't want to uh, uh, make this discussion uncontrollable, but uh, Mike, uh, uh, you have recently signed an important document as uh, uh, one of the 70 or so uh, uh, ex-government uh, uh, um, official from the uh, uh, Republican Party. Uh, what's your expectation for uh, uh, next uh, U.S. leadership vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Japan? Well, um, yeah, a large number of former members of Congress on the Republican side and um, Justice Department political appointees, senior officials in the Reagan, Bush, Bush, and Trump administrations have been putting out these um, statements. I don't know if it will make a difference, but it certainly is uh, based on our strongly held convictions and worries about um, the way President Trump is, um, you know, failing to provide unity. If I can quote Nobu, um, I will say though the Trump administration has senior officials who are completely aligned with the strategy Nobu just described and, and, are, and have a very similar Mahanian maritime strategic view. And that is a real strength for us right now in uh, foreign policy because um, I think generally the national security establishment in the U.S. and Japan are well aligned. And I think um, that would be true under a Biden administration too. If you look at the public opinion polls um, on a variety of questions, not just how do you trust Japan, but about policy in Asia, um, the American public and Japanese public are pretty well aligned, actually, on most issues. So I think there will be, I'm, I'm worried about our election too, uh, but I think there will be strong uh, continuity. It's really going to be a question about whether or not the leadership is able to provide unity internationally at a time when we really need it. But in terms of US-Japan, that in many ways is the least of our worries right now, in my view. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we're going to go to uh, uh, Ambassador David Shear. Thanks for joining us, Nobu, and I look forward to seeing your book. And thanks also to Sasakawa USA for bringing us all together today. Nobu, you alluded to increased importance to Japan of Southeast Asia, I think both strategically and economically. And this is a region in which the United States traditionally has not placed a high strategic priority. And in fact, if you look at our current strategic posture in Asia, we're much stronger in Northeast Asia. We have lots, lots of forward deployed forces. We have strong, capable allies in both Japan and the ROK. It's quite the opposite in Southeast Asia, however, where we have fewer forward deployed forces, much weaker, less reliable allies. Is this a matter of concern for you? And what should we be doing about it? And what's Japan going to do about it? CPT, uh, CPTPP was a great start, but is, uh, is there more? Well, thank you, thank, thank, thank Dave. Um, the, our system is totally oriented to cope with Russians. Never thought of fighting against Chinese. China was on our side after 1970s. Um, that was our 
thinking. When China starts to be a bit strange in, in this century, our thinking was basically don't, don't provoke them from they can be mobilized into the very wrong direction. So don't provoke them, don't poke into their eyes. In other words, our thinking about whether we provoke them or not, they're, they're going into very wrong direction today. But how to frame them, how to engage them, and we have to think about it seriously. One, they don't listen to the weak. We have to pressure them from the position of strength, militarily, economically, and in terms of ideas and values. Values ideas are okay, we can never be defeated by communists. Economically, we are faster and bigger. Militarily, we, at least locally, uh, we, could, we could have a great difficulties to deal with them. We need some rehabilitation here. This is not concept. Concept is useful, but we have to train together. Otherwise, we cannot fight each other. <laughs> that means we cannot deal with China. We have to do something together. It's now time to think about it. And we have to be careful because they, they, that communist propaganda machine is very strong and the sharp power. They, they use everything for their excuse. So we should not give them the chance to criticize us being offensive, aggressive. So we have to talk to each other quietly, but we have to be prepared now, in particular on Taiwan. Um, Russia will never attack NATO, even Estonia. And North Korea will never attack South Korea, it's suicidal. But China can attack Taiwan, not today, but 10 years later. When they are stronger than today, much, much stronger. When they believe that they could finish war, say, in two weeks, they will do it. So we have to, we have to frame Chinese policy, don't, don't do it. We don't, we're not happy for pushing Taiwan into independence, happy for this status quo. But we have to maintain this status quo for a long time up to the moment when China rethink about their regime. And it will not come very soon, maybe two decades, three decades. It's just like the grand strategy of George Kennan. When he launched a new concept of X, X article, of course he had no backing up policies. <laughs> he just started it. And the policies came in one by one. And we could successfully uh, frame Russia to change themselves and they collapse from inside. And they are still struggling to change, but they don't change very easily. But they don't share the history of freedom. They don't share the liberal narrative so, like ours. It takes time for them to change. The C does not understand the free world at all. And the digital technology is giving him a huge edge to control the 1.2 billion people. But we are on the winning side. So we have to prepare, we have to be prepared for coming at least two decades, three decades. And military parts, we have to start talking very quietly to each other, including Taiwan. Korea could be very difficult, I have to say. They need the time to change it too. <laughs> it's, they are still very much in Cold War framework. They criticize their conservatives, Japan, the United States, much less US, but they criticize us together with their conservatives. And they can't escape from that domestic context. It takes time for them to, to get matured strategically. It takes time. It's a long, it's a long time, it's a long term strategy that is necessary for us now to frame Asia for liberal order. Thank you. David, would you like to respond or? No, thank you very much. I agree completely. And uh, we spent a lot of time working together um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. on this project. Thank you. Ambassador Deming. Yes. Nobusan, thank you very much for Hi. all you have done over the years. And I'm delighted that your retirement from government does not mean the end of your contributions. Um, uh, well, the question I want, Mike Green basically asked the fundamental question about continuity, but let me drill down a little bit about the national security structure. When this new, under Abe, this new structure put together, all-star team, Yachi-san, yourself, Takamizawa-san, very strong combo chokan, very strong uh, chief cabinet secretary, a new prime minister coming in, even with the same policies, if he's less dedicated, to putting the right people in the right places, maintaining the structure. Isn't there the risk of erosion as ministries try to pull back power from the National Security Council, from the Conte, and you could have a decentralization of, of the very coherent 
strategy Japan has had over the, over, over the last, under the Abe administration. Isn't there a risk of structural, structural erosion? Thanks very much. But institution, institution wise, Japan's government became far stronger than before. The DOD, I mean, the, the Defense Ministry, Foreign Ministry are now very close, much closer than before. Three forces are more integrated, not very much, but very, very integrated. The chief staff, joint chief staff sees prime minister very often. This was not the case before. And inter community is now connected to the policy makers. This was not the case before. Now we are being a uh, true government. And this will continue, and, but the, the person-wise, it's the choice of the new prime minister. I can't say, I have to say, the chief cabinet secretary's post became very important. It's not just like before. In nine, up to 1990s, chief cabinet secretary was just rubber stamper. The bureaucrats give the paper, rubber stamp, it was chief cabinet secretary. Now he's a true power center, he has to coordinate all the ministries, agencies, and he has to coordinate the ruling party comito and deal with the diets. Uh, he's a true power sector now, Suga is excellent. He's a very good chief cabinet secretary, but that caliber is not easy to find. So the next prime minister must choose a very good wife, that's chief cabinet secretary, it's vital. And he has to choose a good defense minister and foreign minister. We are lucky because Abe's government was just after Democrats' government. So all the factions they be got together. They made the best team to defeat, to, to never lose the power again to demos. That was their determination. Now the opposition is not very weak. Of course, LDP is a bit relaxed. So uh, I don't know who, who, who would be the prime minister. Of course, Kishida san is a foreigner. But Suga san could be. Kona is rising in popularity. Ishiba san is running ahead. So let's see who would be the next prime minister. But the team is very important, not only prime minister. Uh, I can't predict what kind of the government would stand up next, but. Thank you, that was very, very helpful. I, I, I'm hopeful for the future. <laughs> Thank you very much. If I may, uh, um, I would like to ask another question, uh, uh, which is, about the uh, t changing uh, uh, nature of leadership, political leadership in the United States. Uh, United States uh, political leadership has been uh, uh, going uh, uh, through tremendous transformation in terms of race, ethnicity, and gender. And Japanese uh, has traditionally deal with, uh, uh, dealt with white male political leadership, uh, uh, to put it in a general term. How ready Japan is in terms of uh, 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 dealing with and communicating with uh, uh, new uh, uh, types of leadership uh, in the United States, which Japan has not, not traditionally uh, very strong? Um, the the president, president Obama was the African American, and we are we are we are we are not we're not pale we are, we are we have skin color and it's it, it's rather easier for us to have a uh, the variety of ethnicity and that's the beauty of the united states the i have to say the in 1920s 30s when the, in california japanese were kicked out with the chinese i'm not very happy and the it's only after 1960s the New York became the symbol of the United States. All the ethnicities and doesn't matter. And you can compete freely, you can realize your life. That's American dream, that's California, New York. That's the image of the United States. Deep South is not our Chinese American image in Japan at all. And the, it's easier for us to have the Americans as partner who respects diversity who respects the global, um, of course, diversity. And that's the beauty of the United States. It's based upon the principle of American constitution that somehow shocked our prime, the uh, foreign minister Mutsu in each time. And that's, that's something that's pushed forward the world history. I go, when I read the American history, I have to say the independence time French 
or British Enlightenment political thinking, this is one. But evangelicals, the Great Awakening after the independence, and that, that's, that's really polished American principles for a, the equality, diversity, that's the, abolish, abol, uh, the abolitionists. And these things are true beauties that Japanese can truly sympathize with. And this is something that we can build upon. I mean, our relationship, a alliance. This alliance must be based upon a principle. That principle is American constitution principle. That's something we can share totally. That's very close to Asian political thinking. Thank you very much. Any other questions? You can simply uh, raise your hand. Oh, sorry, I see the hands. Uh, Ms. Sakata, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we uh, can great. Hear you. Uh, you. yes, my name is Natsuko Sakata. I'm uh, at this moment the associate uh, to the program of US Japan relations at Harvard. But actually, uh, Mr. Kanehara, I, well, I'm your uh, junior colleague at Foreign Ministry. Gogo <laughs> satashitemasu. <laughs> it's a great opportunity for me to see you online and because actually because of my uh, pr research project at Harvard, I was expecting to see you <laughs> before I uh, left for Boston. Uh, actually, uh, I have one question. Um, I was a little bit surprised to uh, hear your uh, the, 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 the uh, statement uh, right now. Uh, you never uh, mentioned about free and open in the Pacific strategy or vision. Oh. Uh, actually, I keenly remember that at MOFA for ministry, you were the leading promoter and advocate of this Japan's um, mid uh, uh, long term strategy, uh, originated, of course, in 2007 when uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, made a speech at the uh, Indian Parliament. And my uh, exact question is, uh, what is the uh, your expectation towards um, developing this FOIP, free and open uh, in the Pacific uh, vision or strategy, especially in the post-COVID-19 uh, period or the post-election? Election means, of course, both in Japan and the US, uh, really at the midst of the uh, US-China tensions. Uh, or is there any vital factors we need to be very much mindful of? in promoting this um, FOIP further. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I simply didn't name the, didn't mention the name of the strategy. I took it for granted, sorry, but <laughs> FOIP is the name of what I have said. Mm -hmm. This is a value-based uh, diplomacy that the Abe san started in 2003 and had some resonance inside Japan. And we should make clear our flag it's no longer um, ideological conference confrontation time. It's a red flag or a free flag. We, we, we hoist a free, free flag. And as I said, the, we should somehow keep a balance with China. We need the Indians, mm -hmm. not only Australians and ASEAN nations. And for, we have to promote free trade, not RCEP, not Beijing consensus, but high standard. The TPP, Japan, EU, Things. And finally, the liberal order is very important. And we, I'm here, we, I, we are sure that Indo-Pacific regions would be the cradle for Asian free, I mean, the liberal order. And we label it free and open in the Pacific. And this is a grand strategy. This is not a piecemeal policy. This is a grand strategy. And we can realize that by, say, 2050. Mm. Uh, Professor uh, Kanehara, uh, actually, uh, I, uh, right before I was in the, uh, the Chief Cabinet Secretariat uh, and especially uh, in the task team to formulate out the uh, uh, Sejo Sendek, the uh, growth strategy uh, of the Abenomics. And from our side, uh, seeing those, uh, the establishment of the uh, economic team, economic uh, division in the NSC, uh, we are a little bit worried about uh, what kind of orientation they are trying to uh, move forward because uh, from our side, from the uh, growth strategy team, uh, we are uh, directly promoting the uh, you know, free open market mechanisms. But uh, the, looking at the, the current uh, uh, status of the uh, discussion, especially on the economic uh, security, it's more like you know controlling and um, so uh, 
at a glance, it seems like um, whether or not, uh, I, I'm not sure whether or not we can really coexist with this um, uh, grand value of a free open uh, trade system. So, but uh, in, the, uh, uh, in your statement, you clearly mentioned that uh, the economic team uh, of the NSC has just started the discussion trying to uh, matching uh, engineers, scientists, civil societies, et cetera, to see where, you know, what is the, uh, uh, how these uh, technologies are uh, relevant to national security. So uh, we, I understand that we really have to take a carefully look at uh, their discussion uh, going on. But um, uh, this is just kind of a comment uh, uh, from my previous um, assignment that um, the, uh, there is some, something that we really have to take a careful look at the discussion of economic security. Is there anything that you at this moment can say about it? The market, the logic of market is, 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 is different from the logic of national security. And I have to say market mm -hmm. does not exist without national security. Mm -hmm. There are some limits of the commerce or trade from the point of national security. This was the case for, say, Kokon with Russia mm -hmm. during the Cold War. Now, what shall we do with China? China is not like Russia. It's a huge economy, huge markets. And during the time when China was our partner, our supply chains are deeply and very meticulously developed inside China. We're using their, say, agricultural farmers and like, like as, as, as a labor force with a very cheap price, but they were very skillful and they contributed a lot. So we have many students inside Japan, United States, and they're good researchers. They have many patents and licenses on how to decouple China and where. And this is a question that Americans themselves are now asking themselves. And the problem is that the, it's a, it's, it, this, this discussion is led by the Americans but we have to coordinate among allies because when Americans leave, some Japanese Germans come in, it cannot be allowed. So we have to coordinate. Mm -hmm. We need a more systematic approach. Mm -hmm. We need a more transparent approach. And then we can make sure that which technology is precious, too precious to be given to China. And which, can, which company, which technology, up to when, you know, why. We have to specify one by one this is not the concept. This is, this is the trade control. So we need specific reasons for national security. Otherwise, it becomes illegal. And it goes against market forces. And it will not happen. And this is now taking shape now. It's patchwork. You cannot know, not, you cannot know not yet which technology, which area is very sensitive. We can say very easily, say platforms like TikTok, dangerous data transfer. We can say network, deep sea cables, 5G, dangerous. We have to be careful. We have to say semiconductors everywhere inside, say, Pentagon's nuclear weapons or, or refrigerators, it's everywhere. We have to have a clean semiconductors, high-tech ones. There we are working very hard. We can understand that. We can follow them. But apart from the say, quantum technology, mobility, fintech, mm -hmm. genome, and there are many other things that we are looking into the future. And what shall we do together? Then we have to talk to each other. It's not yet to come. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, uh, we are getting close to the time that we must uh, finish, but I'll take one last question from uh, uh, Professor Thomas Berger. Uh, yes, well, thank you very much. I won't, I'll try to keep it very brief since we are headed for time. Um, I think we can all agree that uh, India is of enormous potential importance. It's been very, very difficult historically to get the Indians to go beyond their sort of non-aligned stance. What can we reasonably expect from the Indians? And just as importantly, what can the Indians expect from us and from Japan? Um, uh, we have to give something for them in order to expect them to uh, give us something. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. In India, India is just taking off. They need our help, money, technology, market investments. That's very clear. And the, we believe that they will be, a, that's democracy anyway, and they will be a superpower, and they could be the only one superpower that could counterbalance China. So that we're happy to help them. But India is a, is a big nation, a very smart people, 
they calculate very well their national interests. Uh, they don't, they want to be uh, sort of square 100% ally of ours. They, cal they calculate distances from Russia, China. I have to say, when China was very close to us, and close to say Pakistan, close to the, the Dihads, and to, to face Russians in, Af in Afghanistan, India was forced to go to Russia because they, need, they needed to buy arms. They are not very happy. In the Cold War time, between the, in the tensions between East and the West, they could not be neutral. The non-alignment is fine, but they are buying a lot of arms from Russians. They are forced to do that. They, 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 they were not happy with that. Now they see China is now difficult with the US. They're gradually shifting their positions. Of course, they are bound by non-alliance non non policy, but Modi is gradually shifting. We have to see also insights, insights India, of course, Congress, Xin had great difficulties to move from there, but we had nuclear deals with them. It's a big breaking ice for an Indian government that Xin did it. Modi is coming closer to us, we have to help them. But this is not a uh, middle-sized power. This is a superpower, and they would be very, very much independent. But thanks to China, I believe that their strategic thinking is coming closer to us is the right thing, and we can help them. Thank you very much. Uh, we must uh, uh, conclude the event today. And Mr. Kanehara, would you like to uh, okay. uh, have a final word? Yeah, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Rash. Happy to see you. I have to say that all Japanese strategic thinkers are your students. If you make a mistake, it's yours. Okay. Thank you very much for joining me. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Kanehara, for uh, uh, insightful and original uh, 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 view on uh, uh, US-Japan uh, relationship. I really appreciate your taking time. I also would like to uh, uh, chime in with Ambassador Deming that uh, uh, um, you have a, a continuously uh, important role to play in the private sector. So I'm looking forward to having you again at the Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. I know there are many uh, uh, policy related events in Washington and you have choices. And thank you very much for uh, uh, joining us this morning. And I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you again. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you.